Okay, so I think I'll get started. Um, I know a lot of you are still very busy working on Lior's homework problems, so I hope you'll put down your piece of paper for a little bit longer and, and hear about repeats. Um, we're supposed to introduce ourselves, so I'm Melissa Jimrick. Um, I just started a lab at UCSD in Departments of Medicine and Computer Science. Uh, we spend most of our time thinking about repetitive regions of the genome that actually most other people are maybe smart enough to avoid, as we'll see they're pretty scary places to look. Uh, we spend a lot of our time on methods development for looking at these repeats. We also do a fair amount of applications, but um, today I thought I'd focus more on the methods since we're methods people, um, but also highlight some of the challenges that we still don't have the answers to in dealing with these repeats um, to maybe get you started thinking about some of those. So we haven't really heard a whole lot about GWAS yet this week, but I think probably most of us know what GWAS is, genome-wide association studies, which are basically you know, looking at, at different mutations in our genomes and seeing if we can find associations between these variants and some disease. And you know, as human geneticists, well, GWAS has been actually pretty successful in its goal of finding associations between regions of the genome and different human conditions. We found you know, thousands or tens of thousands of, of GWAS hits um, in populations. But most of the GWAS hits that we've found and focused on um, look something like this, where we're looking at, at SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms, and we ask, say, you know, in this case, is whether or not you have a, a C or a T at this particular position associated with this disease. And most of the GWAS studies that we have done um, have focused almost exclusively on these SNPs. Um, but we all know that's just one window into the ways in which our genomes can vary. So I think it's sometimes helpful to take a step back and look at different ways in which our genomes can vary from one another. Um, to keep track of each, how, how much variation is contributed by each of these mutation classes, I'm going to show on the bottom right corner of the slides here um, how many de novo variants we would expect for each of these classes per generation, per new human. And so just to review, we all know about SNPs. Um, we have a single base pair change. Here's a T to an A. We actually expect around 50 new SNP mutations per generation. But we can also go a little bit more complicated than that. We can have short indels or insertions or deletions of one or more base pairs, such as deleting a T shown here. Uh, these are actually less variable than SNPs. You expect maybe three new short indels like this per generation. We can get even more complicated. We can have structural variation or copy number variants that are taking chunks of our genome and, and rearranging it or, or duplicating it in, in big chunks. Uh, we can also have you know, crazier things like retrotransposition events where you have pieces of the genome jumping from one place to another. The type of variation that, that we're going to focus on is something called short tandem repeats. Um, here you have short repeat motifs, so something like the CAG repeat shown here. Uh, repeated in tandem. Because these regions are so repetitive, it can cause DNA replication to get confused. And so the DNA can kind of loop back on itself while it's trying to replicate. And you might get some errors in the number of repeats at these STRs. So as a result of this kind of confusion of DNA replication, you get really, really high mutation rates at these repeats. And if you look at the number of, of de novo STR variants you expect, per new human, you actually get more de novo STR mutations per generation um, than actually when you add up all the other classes of mutation we talked about so far. Okay, so these are a really important contributor to genetic variation in humans, so maybe it's, it's worth our time to figure out how we can analyze these in a good way. Before we go on, I always like to, to say what's my definition of an STR. If you talk to different people, you'll get def different definitions. We look at things where the motif length is between one and six base pairs, so all the way from homopolymers, so AAAAA, which is uh, actually really difficult, up to hexanucleotide repeats. If you put those all together, you get something about eight base pairs long in the reference sequence. That's our, our threshold. Different people have different thresholds. We actually worked hard to find a threshold that makes sense. We do allow for imperfections in the repeat sequences. So, for instance, you can get some SNPs or indels within the repeat sequence itself. Sometimes that's still okay. 
And using our definition, we get about a million and a half of these STRs if you look in the HD19 reference genome. Okay, so we've known for you know, several decades or so that STRs are important for human phenotype. There's at least 40 Mendelian conditions um, that we think are, are caused usually by expansions of these STRs in our genomes. And I'll just point out one example that many people are often familiar with, which is Huntington's disease. So in Huntington's disease, you have a CAG repeat in the coding region of a, of a gene, HTT, which encodes for polyglutamine. Uh, most people have around 20 or so copies of the CAG repeat. Um, in some cases, it can expand to say, 40 or more copies of the CAG repeat. In that case, you end up with this devastating neurological disorder. Um, and, and many of these disorders follow similar trends, where you get some large expansion um, in the number of repeats, usually in coding regions, they can also fall in other places. But one thing I think that's really striking about Huntington's disease and a lot of these other examples as well is that this repeat doesn't act simply as a switch controlling whether or not you get the disease, but it acts along some quantitative scale. So if you look at Huntington's disease and you plot the number of repeats of CAG versus the age of onset of the disease, um, you'll see this really, really nice linear correlation uh, between the number of repeats and the age of onset. So the more repeats you have, the earlier you're likely to get the disease. Um, this is you know, very well known for Huntington's disease, but not specific to Huntington's, it occurs in, in a lot of these other disorders as well. So this is actually really striking and tells us that these STRs can act kind of a, as a switch. We can kind of fine tune a quantitative type of phenotype. So it got us thinking about the types of, of questions that really drove us to do a, a lot of the work that I'll present here, which is, okay, we, we know that these STRs are important in these Mendelian disorders, um, but do they actually have some role in more complex or polygenic traits in humans, especially now that we know that they can act on this kind of quantitative fine-tuning scale? So that's kind of the, the, the big picture that we have in mind, and we don't have um, you know, all the solutions to this question yet, but that's kind of what's driving a lot of what we're looking at. Okay, so we'd like to be able to figure out, you know, what is the role of these repeats in complex traits in humans? So eventually, we'd like to, you know, take a bunch of people, some that have some, some disease and some that don't, and ask for a given repeat, is there some association between, say, the number of copies of the repeat and whether or not you get this disorder? But um, there's lots of things that we need to be able to do before we can even get to that point. Well, for one thing, I'm going to talk a lot about how STRs are really difficult to look at. And before we can do anything, we really need some tools to look at these repeats on a genome-wide scale. Once we have those tools, then we can start to apply them to larger cohorts of individuals and eventually combine that with some phenotype information to start to answer some of these questions about whether or not STRs, you know, more broadly are, are associated with complex traits in humans. Um, so this slide kind of gives an outline of what I'll talk about. Uh, we're going to focus mostly on the methods and, and a lot of the challenges that still remain there. And I'll talk a little bit about how we're now starting to apply these methods to learn more about how these STRs can indeed affect um, different phenotypes in humans. Okay, so I, I mentioned most people avoid STRs, uh, which is what, what I did for a while as well. Um, and it turns out that's because they're really, really difficult to look at. And I thought I'd just start by pointing out the challenges that we thought about when we first started thinking about the problem of how can we genotype these STRs from sequencing data. And just kind of as a, a prereq, we all, we all know this, I think, but if you're looking at next generation sequencing data, um, you don't just sequence the genome in one big long read, although I guess we're maybe like getting closer to that. But we chop up the genome into a bunch of little pieces. So we have a bunch of little pieces called reads. So the first challenge that we thought about was, okay, if I have this repeat, well, only reads that entirely span the STR can really be that informative about the number of copies of the repeat that are present. So if I have a CAA repeat, like the one shown here, and I have a read that only partially expands into that repeat, well, that's consistent with four copies of CAA. It could also be consistent with five copies. I just didn't read far enough into the repeat region. 
Um, or you know, any number of copies greater than five. It's ambiguous, only given this one read, how many copies are actually there. Only reads that look something like this, where I completely span the repeat, plus some non-repetitive flanking region on either end, are really informative of the number of, of repeat copies. That's not entirely true, I'll expand on that a little bit later, um, but for now that's what we're working with. Another issue is that non-reference alleles present as really big indels when we try and align these reads back to the reference genome. So if I have a CAA repeat that has, say, five additional CAA copies then compared to the reference genome, um, and now I'm trying to you know, put it into my favorite liner, Bowtie or BWA or something, um, that actually shows up as a 15 base pair insertion. Um, at least at the time that we were developing a lot of these tools, this would just get completely ignored by standard aligners, it would go into our bucket of unaligned reads and we would never even see this variation. So that was a really big challenge, is that you know, a lot of our reads just looked like the reference allele because that's the only thing that would get aligned. A third issue is that SCRs can be really noisy. So we get a lot of noise, something we call PCR stutter. So just like DNA replication gets confusing in your, in your bodies and, and messes up the number of copies of the repeat, um, when you do amplification of your DNA to prepare for sequencing, you can also introduce a lot of errors. Um, in the old school way of genotyping STRs, which is called capillary electrophoresis, um, this would show up in these little peaks that you would get. So usually you would you know, PCR amplify your region with your STR in it and look at the size of the products and use that to figure out how many repeats are there. And you would get peaks that, you know, nice peaks corresponding to the true alleles that are, are really there, we should also get these little blips um, that they correspond to these PCR stutter errors that were introduced um, during the sample prep step. If we look at next generation sequencing data, uh, that might look something like this. So all of the, these are reads, an example where all these reads originated from a locus that had the same number of repeat copies. Um, but because of this PCR amplification step, presumably, you get these errors in the number of repeat copies um, so you actually see a lot of noise. And it's sometimes difficult, um, given this noisy data, to figure out, well, how many copies actually were there. So we have this tool that's been out for a while now called Lobster that deals with a lot of these challenges. Um, I'll briefly introduce the steps of Lobster. Um, so first we have this sensing step. And the idea here is that we want to quickly pick out which reads in our data are going to be informative about STRs. So we look for reads that look like they contain some repetitive region with some non-repetitive flanking region on either end, and we figure out what the likely motif is for that STR. Once we have our bucket of reads that all map to presumably repeat uh, locations, then we want to go and align those back to the genome. So the second step of lobster is this alignment step, um, where we break up our read into the repeat region and the non-repeat regions, and the trick here is going to be that we focus only on aligning the non-repetitive regions back to the reference genome. Once we have all of our reads aligned to each locus, we have it's called an allelotyping step, where we pile up all those reads at each locus, we have some model of this PCR stutter noise, and we use that to determine the maximum likelihood genotype at each locus. Um, Lobster has actually uh, just had its five years birthday, so it's been out for a while. Um, and we've made a lot of improvements on Lobster since it originally came out, but I still think it's helpful to go a little bit more in detail about the different steps um, so that I can then explain about how we build on those steps um, to build a new and improved set of genotyping tools. So I'll say a little bit more about how these different steps work. Okay, so we start with the sensing step. And just to reiterate the, the problem, um, Back when we were first thinking about you know, how to genotype these repeats from sequencing data, I mentioned the liners were just throwing away a lot of reads that should go to these STR regions. So a big challenge was how can we rescue all these reads in a really quick way. So that's the job of the sensing step, which is where we want to have a way to quickly detect which reads in our data contain repeats. Um, we found that entropy of the sequence is actually a really useful way to do this. So think about what does entropy mean um, it's a measure of disorder. So repetitive sequences, there's not that much disorder in them. They have a, you know, a very predictable pattern. So repetitive sequences tend to have much lower entropy uh, than if you look at non-repetitive sequences. 
Okay, so we tried using entropy as a way to classify between repetitive and non-repetitive sequences. Um, first, just using single nucleotide frequencies. And we found that already this was doing a, a pretty decent job of separating between repetitive and random sequences. Um, if we use dinucleotide entropy, um, where the dinucleotides are, are now our alphabet, um, that does even better. So, so this is what we decided to go with. Okay, so we have this entropy metric that can tell us whether a sequence is, is likely repetitive or not. Now we can just apply this entropy metric in windows across our read. And if we, if we look at the profile of this entropy metric across the read, we can identify reads that have a signature like this, where you have a low entropy region in the middle, presumably cor corresponding to the repetitive region, um, plus some high entropy regions on the flanking regions, which are presumably this non-repetitive flanking regions that we're going to use in the next step for alignment. And we can go and characterize this repeat and say, OK, this looks like it's a, a TG repeat in the middle of this read. OK, now once we've identified our repetitive reads, we can go on to our alignment step, which is now we want, we have this read. It contains a repeat. We want to know where in the heck from the genome it came from. Well, I mentioned that aligners have a lot of trouble aligning across these repetitive regions. Um, so the main trick that we focus on here is aligning only these non-repetitive flanking regions that don't contain any repeat sequence back to the genome, focusing only on regions where we know there's actually an STR present. And we can use some tricks, like use some paired-end information to help us add specificity to our alignment process. Um, and, and based on where these flanking regions align back to the genome, we can then determine how many repeat copies are present in this read. OK, now we have all these, these repeat-containing reads aligned back to the reference genome. Uh, but we still have this issue of PCR stutter. So I, I mentioned if you look at the raw read at these STRs, you can get a lot of mess. This is actually you know, a relatively clean example where we only have you know, mess of uh, plus or minus a couple repeat units. Okay, so we, we tried to model this PCR stutter mess issue, um, focusing on a couple of different properties. So the first thing we looked at was a locus-specific probability. Um, what's the probability that we're going to see any stutter noise at this locus? So we found a lot of properties of repeats such as the motif length, or the total length, or the local GC content, for instance, um, influence how likely we are to see any noise at that locus. Um, as an example, motif length was the strongest predictor of stutter noise. Um, if you look at dinucleotide repeats or homopolymers, they're extremely noisy. As you get to longer and longer repeat motifs, um, those are less and less noisy. So motif length was actually the strongest predictor. We, actually, we also look at the step size distribution. So given that we see any stutter noise, what does the step size look like? Um, so this is just showing a distribution of those step sizes. We found that most stutter events um, actually tend to decrease the number of repeats by one unit compared to the true allele. Okay, so these are the, the two properties that we focused on. Um, we actually learned the parameters of these, of these two things, looking at male sex chromosomes, where we think there's only one true allele present, and so we can assume that reads that, that don't match the modal allele are likely to be errors. Okay, so we can use what we learn about PCR stutter um, to build our likelihood model for STR genotypes. Uh, and basically, the data that we have at each locus is just a vector, uh, but for each read, how many repeat copies of our STR were observed. Okay, so we, we put this into a likelihood model where we'd like to know what's the probability of seeing this data in our reads, given some underlying diploid genotype and our stutter model. Um, so we assume that all the reads are independent, so we want to know what's the probability of each individual read, given some underlying diploid genotype. Um, for lobster, we just assume that each read has 50-50 probability coming from each of the two possible alleles. Um, and so then for each read, we want to know what's the probability of observing this read, given that it came from some allele A, um, we can get that using the, the parameters that we learned of our stutter model. Okay, so that's kind of in a nutshell how Lobster calculates these likelihoods. Um, now that we can calculate these likelihoods for any possible diploid genotype, um, we can look at a given locus and just compute these likelihoods for all possible diploid genotypes, searching over some, some grid of the possible alleles, and um, determine the maximum likelihood diploid genotype. 
So in this case, um, it makes sense. We have a bunch of reads that support copy number counts of 13 and 14. One guy says 15, so we return maximum likelihood of um, one copy has 13 copies, um, the other lil has 14 copies. Okay, so Lobster actually ends up doing pretty well, at least when you have high coverage data. I'll talk about some of the challenges with coverage. So this is just a, a preview into how a Lobster does on, um, this is actually from the Simon's Genome Diversity Panel, uh, where we have both Lobster genotypes um, and also capillary electrophoresis genotypes um, for a set of about 300 samples. Um, and to compare these genotypes, we use something called the STR dosage, which is just looking at the sum of the two alleles of the repeat. So we plot on the x-axis here the STR dosage reported by the capillary electrophoresis. On the y-axis, the STR dosage reported at each call by lobster. And here the size of the bubble just represents how many calls are in each dot. Um, so for high coverage data, at least, we see quite good correlation with the capillary data. Um, maybe a bit more misleading, and the number that you really care about is the genotype concordance rate. Well, if we just look at the raw genotype concordance between lobster and the capillary data, um, they're about 93% concordant. Okay, so that was lobster. Um, and, and as I mentioned, lobster does a pretty good job on this high coverage data, at least when we compare it to capillary data. Um, but there's still a lot of challenges. So, you know, we had this sensing step where we quickly pick out informative reads with the sequence entropy metric. Well, that, that actually works pretty well and it's pretty fast, but there's this trade-off between sensitiv sensitivity versus speed. We have to have some threshold for the entropy of something that we're willing to take. That might work better for different types of repeats than for others. So ultimately, there are going to be things that we just miss because they don't pass this, this entropy threshold that we're using, or they're too imperfect, or they're not repetitive enough, or whatever. Um, alignment at these repeats are, are still pretty messy, so maybe we can get the read to the right place, um, but local realignment can be really difficult, especially when you have, say, sequencing errors or kind of messy repetitive regions surrounding your STR, so that's still a big challenge. Our little typing step, you'll notice I didn't have any term in there accounting for errors, so we're really sensitive to if you have, say, a read aligned to the wrong location accidentally, and it has some outlier genotype, well, our, our little typing model is really sensitive to that. We also only focused on the length of the STR. We didn't do anything about you know, sequence variance inside of the STR that we might care about for different types of applications. Previously for Lobster, our main challenge in the first place was really finding where are all these repetitive reads. So we spent a lot of effort on the sensing alignment step, digging out from our raw reads, well, where are all the reads that contain the repeats? Um, since we worked on Lobster, new aligners, um, specifically we use BWA Memolot, are actually doing a much, much better job at picking up um, a lot of these repetitive regions and are much more sensitive to big insertions or deletions from the reference genome. So we can kind of shift our attention from you know, trying hard to, to pick up all these lost reads actually use information that we're already getting out of these aligners like BWA MEM. Um, it can now focus a lot more on you know, refining these problematic alignments and also paying more attention to our error models to do a better job at the genotyping. So there's actually a, a new generation of STR caller recently out um, called Hipster. So it's the next generation of Lobster. Um, I'm not going to go and wait for the third one. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to go in depth through all the hipster stuff, so I want to give you an idea of how it works and, and how it improves on uh, what we've been doing in the lobster tool. Um, so now, instead of starting with our raw reads, um, we can actually just start with the BAM files that people have already aligned using BWA MEM, which is actually most of the data that we have sitting around now. So we don't have to waste a lot of effort in trying to realign the data ourselves, which is a really, really big computational burden. And if existing aligners are doing a good enough job, um, then this saves a ton of time, allowing us to focus on you know, the downstream steps of that. Um, also notice that we input a population of samples. So we can now do multi-sample calling and use information across samples to improve this process, whereas Lobster really focused just on, on calling for a single sample, at least initially. Okay, now we're looking at a population of samples um, we've improved our error models so that now we use an EM approach 
to calculate this stutter error model individually per locus, rather than having to aggregate sites across the genome. And this actually works extremely well um, in getting per locus stutter probabilities and modeling the distribu distribution of step sizes per locus. Now we have a population, we can identify a candidate set of alleles. And now we can look at each read in our data set and try aligning it back to each candidate set of alleles to get per allele likelihoods using both the sequence information and the stutter model information. Um, and we can kind of do this iterative process where we try to align our reads back to our candidate alleles, calculate maximum likelihood genotypes, see if we have any new possible candidate genotypes, and iterate this process um, until we converge on a good set of genotypes. Finally, we can output all the samples in, in a VCF file. Um, and I'll just make a side note here, is that we've made a lot of effort to have our tools deal with standard file formats, like BAMs and VCFs. Um, and what we found is that if you don't deal with standard file formats and you don't make your tools easy to use, then nobody's gonna use it. So it's kind of a lesson that I, I learned in this process is that it's worth putting in that extra effort to make your tools useful by the community and not just by your individual lab. Um, it's also been, actually been really helpful that we've had you know, improvements from other people in the community, I think because we made the effort to make these user friendly. Um, okay, I just wanted to give a little bit of insight on how the hipster genotyping model um, compares to the lobster genotyping model since, in principle, they're very similar, but there are some key differences that, that the hipster model improves on. Um, so again, you know, we have, we treat each of our reads at our locus um, independently. In lobster, we treated each read as having a 50-50 probability from coming from, of coming from either of the two alleles. Um, well, now that we take into account sequence variation, we can use, say, heterozygous FIPS that are nearby to get phase probabilities from each read um, and really improve this by using some, some prior information from SNPs about which, which allele a given read might have originated from. Um, and that turned out to improve our accuracy quite a bit. Um, again, now that we have you know, more data, we're looking at multiple samples at once, we can learn these stutter parameters per locus rather than having to learn a single model genome-wide, um, which has also uh, been really helpful in improving our accuracy. Okay, so like any tool you make, you wanna see how you compare to other tools. Um, of course, your tool will always look the best in your comparison, so that's always a caveat here. Um, but we actually made a big effort in comparing our tool to other tools um, and trying to kind of vary the parameters of the other tools to get them to work as good as, as well as possible at STRs, um, rather than just using out of the box settings, uh, which I think is important to keep in mind when you're performing these types of comparisons. So we took each of these tools and we tried, you know, tuning different filtering parameters that are spit out by each of these tools, and use that to get a plot of the sensitivity to pick out at STRs versus the accuracy and genotyping into these STRs. Okay, so we, we looked at a lot of tools that you've, you've probably heard of. Um, you see Lobster in there, you see GATK, you see uh, SAM Tools is on there somewhere, um, and you see Hipster at the top. Um, so despite our efforts to make other tools look worse, of course, uh, anyway, ours is, is actually doing quite well. So even up to about 90% sensitivity, to capture these STRs, we're getting very, very high accuracy when we compare to capillary electrophoresis data. So about 98% accuracy using our standard set of filters, which is comparable to if you were to take two different capillary electrophoresis experiments and compare those replicates. We're getting comparable accuracy to that gold standard. So it's actually doing quite well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all I'm gonna say about Hipster. Uh, but if you're interested in genotyping repeats and you've been using Lobster, I encourage you to take a look at Hipster because uh, a lot of these improvements can make a, a really big difference in your genotype quality. Um, so along with genotyping STRs, we actually found that visualizing them using standard tools um, is also difficult. There's a whole lot of challenges that we need to deal with looking at repeats compared to if you're just looking at, at you know, SNPs or short indels sequence variation. Um, so one big challenge we dealt with was just visualizing the sequence alignments. We found that a lot of visualization tools um, either don't display insertions from the reference genome um, or display them all the same. And you know, we have 
a lot of different types of insertions. In, in this example, we have a heterozygous sample where one allele has four additional base pairs insertion, the other allele has eight base pair insertion. If I load this to the UCSC genome browser or to IGV, um, then those both get displayed the same. And I can't tell the difference between these two different alleles. So we have a, a new flavor of, of alignment viewer called PyBAM view um, that I really like. Uh, one, one feature of it is that you can run it in your web browser. So you can just display um, your sequence alignments in your web browser and then send your friend a link uh, to view the same alignments rather than have to send them an entire BAM file. Um, that's all great. It doesn't have all the kind of features that the Genome Browser or IGV has. So what we'd really like is for those tools to be able to work with uh, repeat variation. So I'm, I'm really excited that Jim Robinson, who is the IGV guy, is actually now at UCSD. So we're working with the IGV team to try and, and make support for hipster VCFs and eventually for STR sequence alignments as well. So that's really exciting work in progress. Okay, so I told you about these great tools for genotyping repeats from your sequencing data, um, but what are the challenges that, that are still there? Well, I think actually one of the biggest challenges we deal with is long STRs. So these methods, both lobster and hipster, have focused on things that be, can be completely spanned by a single sequencing read. Uh, well, that's great if your repeat is short enough, uh, but if you have really long repeats, there's just no hope of seeing it. Or even worse, if you're heterozygous and you have one repeat copy that's really short and one really long allele, well, then we're going to be blind to that, and we're just going to call you homozygous for the shorter allele. Um, and that can be really dangerous when we're trying to do things like association studies, when you get just random dropout of longer alleles. Okay, so we focus so far on these things that are, are spanable by a single read, um, but there's actually information in other types of read as well that so far lobster and hipster are ignoring. Um, so we you know, actually thought of a bunch of different classes of paired end reads that we could think about that do give information about the underlying repeat copy. Um, so hipster and lobster focus on this first class of read. We have it class one, where there the informative thing is the copy number. So we've completely spanned the repeat and we can count it. We can also think about other types of information we might extract from paired end reads such as here, this, this class two, maybe the insert size is informative, or in this, what we call class three. Um, if you have uh, reads where one mate is completely inside the repeat and one is outside the repeat, um, well, both the copy number of those reads and the, the distance of the mate from the repeat can be informative. So, and I won't go through all of these, I just want to make the point that there are, there are sources of information and paired end reads that we're not yet fully exploiting that can be used to get at repeat lengths that are longer than the sequencing read length. Um, so Nima Musavi and my group is, is working hard on a method that incorporates all these different sources of information into a single model that can get both the shorter type things that the hipster and lobster have picked up, but also are, are looking at these expansions like you might see in, in Huntington's disease or Fragile X that can't be spanned by a single read. So um, coming soon, it's gonna be gangster, I'm just, claiming this name for now so that nobody steals this name from us, which I'm really nervous about. <laughs> so don't name your tool gangster. <laughs> um, okay, and then another challenge that we're thinking a lot about these days is how can we incorporate um, things that are coming out from these long read sequencing technologies. So we're starting to look at PAC bio and nanopore data and also a little bit at, at 10x data. With the longer reads, theoretically, we can get to extremely long repeat copy number and not have to do all these tricks with the Illumina paired end data, um, which are, are kind of tricky. Um, the big problem we have with the long read data for now is that it's, it's really messy, it's really scary. I don't know if you ever bladded a, a nanopore read against the reference genome. Um, it can, for repeats, they can give us some idea of how long it is, but there's tons of little insertions and deletions and you know, errors inside the repeat region, it's not, just, it's not trivial to go to these reads and count the number of repeat copies. So it's actually, I think, um, a substantial amount of methods development that needs to be done to get accurate you know, SCR or even you know, SNP and, 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 and whatever genotypes from these long reads, but it's a, a really promising direction, so we're starting to look at that. Okay, so we have 
these tools for getting these repeats from sequencing data. Um, now we can actually start to go into large cohorts of sequencing data sets and apply them to learn about properties of STR variation that we just couldn't look at before. Uh, as a first pass at this, um, we applied lobster to the 1,000 genomes data. Uh, I think probably most people are familiar with 1,000 genomes, even though it's getting kind of outdated for now. Um, but we looked at about 1,000 low coverage whole genome sequencing data sets from various populations. At the time, it seemed like a lot of data, or like two terabytes of data, is so big. So we built a pipeline to do this on Amazon Cloud. Um, now we're trying to figure out how to process, you know, hundreds of terabytes of data. So it's growing really, really rapidly. But we did 1,000 genomes as a first pass to see how we did. The first thing we wanted to evaluate how, how at this time, lobster, you know, now we're applying a hipster, um, can do on these low coverage data sets. Okay, so we did this comparison to the capillary data. I've already explained this type of plot. Um, but basically, our, our correlation with the capillary data for 1,000 genomes was 71%. So, you know, we're, we're picking up some true alleles, but it's not particularly impressive at the per genotype level. Um, we also wanted to see how well we could get um, just a little frequency distributions from the population. So this is low coverage data. Our individual genotypes aren't that great. Um, but what we found, if we look at different repeats, such as the CODIS markers used by the FBI, and we look at the allele frequency distribution that we picked up, so here's lobster in black versus what had previously been published. So here in this example, the CODIS is in red. Well, our allele frequency distributions look pretty similar, um, at least when we look across many, many different individuals. Main challenge in the 1,000 Genomes project that we dealt with is the issue of, of heterozygous low coverage. So on average, we had only about one or two reads per genotype call on our data. We were quite accurate at homozygous sites, but if we look at heterozygous sites, um, only at 13% of the cases could we actually pick up both alleles. So especially for the case of STR calling, low coverage data is, is basically hopeless if you want to have accurate genotype accuracy. Um, especially because we can only deal with reads here that are completely spanning the STR, so a lot of the reads we just have to, to throw away. Uh, luckily, sequencing data sets are getting bigger and better, so now we've applied Lobster to um, many different data sets. This is an example from the Simon Genome Diversity Project, where we looked at 300 deeply sequenced PCR-free genomes with diverse origins from around the world. This catalog was, was recently published in September. Um, but we found that the higher coverage data can do a lot better than the 1,000 genomes data was doing. So if we look at our concordance with the capillary data, um, now we're up to 93% concordance with the capillary data. If you go and apply HIPSR to this data, you can get that up to about 98%. Um, for fun, we decided to do just take the homopolymers, which if you've you know, worked with sequencing data, uh, you're probably afraid of the word homopolymer because they're really, really difficult to genotype. And that still actually is the case. Um, but we decided to take the homopolymers and do a principal component analysis just on the homopolymer genotypes. And even using these you know, traditionally very, very messy and scary regions of the genome, um, we're able to pick out a really nice population structure from this SGDP data set, um, showing us that at least there's some information being captured in these messy homopolymer genotypes. Okay, so now, now we have this catalog of you know, more than a million loci where we have cataloged allele frequencies and in individual genotypes across large numbers of individuals, we can get kind of the first picture of what is the landscape of STR variation across populations. Well, of the 1.3 million loci that we analyzed, about half of them are invariant, but they're not changing the population. About 20% of our loci are biallelic, so you can you know, treat them similarly to um, you know, biallelic SNPs or indels. Um, but I think kind of strikingly, 30% of them are multi-allelic. Some of them have more than 20 common alleles in the population. Um, and this makes analyzing STRs and most type of population genetic applications that you can think about, um, there's an added challenge here, because we can no longer encode things as, as zeros and ones um, when we have many different possible alleles, age or your loci. Um, we can you know, look for, for interesting trends. I'll just give one example. Uh, if we, look at, we can look at how does variation compare to the motif length of the STR. Uh, find that you know, homopolymers are extremely variable. As you get 
longer and longer motif lengths, the amount of variation decreases. So that's one example. We can look at tons of, of different properties of STRs and, and correlate that with variation in our data. Um, I'm not going to have time to talk about, but I, I will mention that all of these STR genotypes that, are, that we're allowed to make publicly available are available on this really great web application set up by Thomas Willems, um, who was in the Ehrlich's lab, where you can go and browse each of your favorite STRs, or even just go and you know, download the, the raw VCS with all the data. Okay, okay. how much time do I have left? Like five minutes. Or five minutes. Okay, so I'll just, I'll just briefly talk about how we're incorporating um, these STRs into association studies, and I might skip past a couple things so I can get to the challenges at the end. Um, but basically, now we have these population-wide catalogs of STR variation, we can start to correlate these with phenotypes and start using this to, to understand whether these STRs are actually indeed relevant to complex traits in humans. As a first pass in this, we focused on STR variations that can affect the transcriptome. Uh, mostly because we have a, a lot of gene expression data available, and because previously in the literature there have been reports of at least single gene studies where STR variants um, can affect um, either gene expression or splicing. So a lot of these tend to be in promoters of genes, where you see these linear relationships between the number of repeats in the promoter of a gene and the expression of the nearby gene. But they're not always in promoters. Sometimes they can be in introns of genes. So here's an example, ECFR, you have an AC dinucleotide in the, the intron of the gene associated with gene expression. Um, you can also get cases where the number of, of repeats is associated with splicing. So there's kind of several dozen of these single gene studies um, by which we know that varying the, the length of an STR can affect um, gene expression or splicing. Our goal is really, now that we have these resources to do this on a bigger scale, can we characterize the effect of STRs of, on expression in a genome-wide scale? Okay, so I'm not going to talk a whole lot about this study, but um, we've basically taken our STR genotypes that we got from the 1,000 Genomes data and combined that with expression data available from the Javadis project um, and then taken every STR that's nearby a gene and trying to do an association study between the number of repeats of the STR and the expression of that nearby gene after controlling for um, some confounding factors like population structure and ethnicity, et cetera. Um, altogether, we did about 190,000 STR by gene tests, and for each test, we also did an unlinked control, where we take, say, an STR on chromosome 1 and test for expression, association with expression on, of a gene on chromosome 5. That's our unlinked controls. Um, so here I'm presenting the results of that as a QQ plot. I don't think we've also seen any QQ plots, I'll just briefly explain. Um, each dot here is an STR by gene test. And here we're just plotting the expected p-value distribution we'd expect under the, the null of no association versus the observed p-values in our data. If we look at this distribution for our unlinked controls, um, as we would expect, we follow a straight line, which means that those p-values are following what we expect under the null distribution of, of no association. But if we look at our observed ESTR data, we see a really strong departure from the null, um, suggesting that we are um, indeed seeing the signal of association between STR and gene expression. Um, altogether, we found um, about 2,000 of these, we call them expression STRs, at FDR 5%. So about 2,000 places in the genome where there's an STR whose length is associated with expression of a nearby gene. Um, okay, I want to zoom past some of this because I want to talk about the, the challenges that we're facing, so we can have some chance to discuss that. Yeah, also, I'll mention that um, you know, our initial study of the effect of STRs on gene expression um, was focused just on 1,000 genomes data um, on a single cell type, which is lymphoblastoid cell lines. Um, but we're now expanding this project to um, the GTEx data, which is a lot higher coverage data. Um, they actually just released 650 high coverage whole genomes. Um, from the DTEx project, for which we also have expression for a lot of different tissues. So now we can do a much deeper study of the effects of you know, both STRs, but other types of sequence variation on gene expression. And following Ora's lead that, like, you, if you get far enough, you're going to mention deep learning. Uh, we're also uh, doing some work with some of these new deep learning tools 
to try and incorporate epigenetics data and see if we can you know, determine some clues into mechanisms by which these STRs might be working. So you can ask me about that offline. Um, but yeah, everybody's doing deep learning, I guess. Okay, now that we have these STR maps, there's a lot of things that we can do. Um, we can, you know, recently we just put a, a paper up on BioArchive about this. We can deeply characterize the STR mutation process at each locus by now looking at our population-wide catalogs. We can do things like phase these STRs onto SNP haplotypes. types. So now we can go and impute them back into GWAS data. Uh, we have a lot of work trying to figure out, you know, given that there might be an STR association in, in some region, um, how can we dissect those in the context of GWAS hits to figure out if STRs versus SNPs are causal variants, which I didn't have time to talk about. Um, there's also you know, a lot of, of work being done on looking at de novo STR mutations and how those might be involved in disease. So these are just some of the many applications that we can do now that we actually have tools to look at these repeat regions of the genome. Okay, I'll just end with some challenges that still remain in analyzing this, these STRs and trying to associate them with disease. So we still face the challenge of genotype accuracy. Hipster is doing really well, but it's still not at the level of state-of-the-art um, SNP genotype callers. So in any type of analysis where you're trying especially to compare effects of different types of variation, like STRs versus SNPs, um, because our genotype accuracy is lower, that, uh, that ends up losing a lot of power when we try to do this analysis. So that's something that we have to deal with in, in any type of association analysis that we're, that we're dealing with, and we still don't have you know, great answers for the best way to deal with that. Second challenge is that these STRs are extremely multi-allelic, as I mentioned. So a lot of tools that people use for, say, association studies or, or imputation or phasing um, don't work out of the box. So you know, we need to deal with um, how, how do we handle um, these, these variations that we can't just encode as a zero or a one. Um, it's unclear how we encode them. You can encode copy number, but what's their sequence variations within that copy number? So the space of alleles gets a lot more complex now that we're looking at these repeats, not just single base pair changes. A third challenge that, that we're really facing is, you know, what by what model do STRs affect phenotype? All of our analyses have focused on linear relationships between copy number and, and risk for some phenotype or, say, gene expression. Um, but we don't really have any biological basis for doing that, and there are many different models that you could think of that make sense based on you know, what the biological question is. Um, so that's something that we're also struggling with. To conclude by saying take a look at our, our website and go find some of these tools. We're really excited about the next steps to incorporate um, a lot of these repeat analyses into medical genetics applications, so hopefully you know, next time I can tell you about some of those.